Welcome to The Tanya Acker Show. I'm Tanya Acker. Welcome to the podcast, Califa. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. I want to talk about your book, Major Labels. Yes. First, I'm in LA. I live off Sunset Boulevard and have for many years. I feel like your book, and we're doing this via audio so people can't see it, but it reminds me, was it intentionally trying to look like Tower Records? Were you trying to bring that feeling back to those of us? Also, there's that tradition in California of those concert flyers, right? They would nail to to telephone poles and and streetlights. And so, yeah, just that feeling, that excitement that you get, you know, from Tower Records, but also from seeing that bands are coming to play and the idea that you're building that excitement, that you're walking down the street and you're saying, ooh, something exciting is happening. So, yes, it was me hoping that people would get excited for the book, too. I did. When I saw the cover and, you know, frankly, I'm one of those who buys a lot of books online, but this is one that's fun to have in hard copy because it is, it's really dramatic. Thank you. And it's reminiscent. It kind of brings me back. The Tower Records era. Yes, to the Tower Records era because I was one of those who, I mean, you go to a music store for hours and just wander and then they started letting you listen to things, which seemed really revolutionary, right? Yeah, when they had the the listening polls and I, I worked in record stores and yeah, at a certain point, record stores started putting record players out to, so that you could sample the wares. But, you know, they say that with gambling addiction, part of the addiction is not just winning money, but knowing that you might lose money, that that's part of the excitement. And when I was a kid, buying records, that was part of the excitement too, was you buy the thing and then you'd take it home and you'd kind of like cross your fingers and wait to see if you had just wasted your lunch money <laughs> on some terrible album. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Because <laughs> it wasn't like, I mean, I, okay, I don't mean to date us, but these kids today don't know how good they have it. You can sample, you can listen before you buy. Yes. But let's talk about your book, which is a book that I, I do think people should buy. And not just music lovers, because it really provides such a great historical context. The book, again, is Major Labels, A History of Popular Music in Seven Genres. Uh, you talk about rock, R&B, country, punk, hip-hop, dance, and pop. So yeah, let's kind of cut to the chase, because one of the things that you say in the book is that music genres have been communities that brought people together and really held people together before we had the digital and social media communities that we have now. Explain to us a little bit about how your book brings that out. Tell us what you mean by that. It's very easy for people to say that genres are bad, that music should just be music. We should all be able to appreciate everything. Let's kind of tear down the boundaries. And I kind of wanted to look back at the history of music in the last 50 years and look at the ways in which genres were really important. And one way to define a musical genre is to say it's a community of musicians and listeners. And, you know, sometimes that's a physical community when everyone's in the same space at a concert or when when musicians are hanging out together trading ideas and sometimes it's more of a virtual community right you put on a record and like you know you put on an earth wind and fire record and you feel like you're part of this kind of r&b world you, you know you put on a slayer record and you feel like you're part of this thrash metal world and the thing about communities is that yes they bring people together and they can be very inclusive But usually they're exclusive too. Usually the ways in which communities are formed is by saying like, some people can come in and other people have to be out. So in the disco era, you had literal gatekeepers, right? You had some guy with a clipboard standing outside the club saying, you can't come in. And, you know, most of the time it's not quite as literal as that. But you find when you go back and you look at the history of music, a lot of it is shaped by these decisions. Who gets to be R&B? Who doesn't get to be R&B? If you're an R&B singer, do you get to be a pop singer, right? You know, Luther Vandross was disappointed throughout his career that he never had a number one pop hit. And in a way, that's a tragedy, right? Because those records are incredible. And, you know, you would have wished a wider audience could have heard them. At the same time, that's part of what R&B audiences feel like Luther Vandross was theirs. He wasn't a pop star. He was an R&B singer, and that that really meant something. And so that push and pull, that, that dynamic of inclusion and exclusion, to me, that really helps tell the story of what happened to music in the last 50 years. What does that mean for fans? 
that sort of inclusion and exclusion. So for instance, you write about being young. I know you grew up in New Haven. You were a young black kid who liked punk music. I didn't know a lot of those. Yeah. Mean, you know, when, when I was young, I remember I had like David Bowie. I mean, I liked all kinds of music. I really considered that I was one of those crossover people. Right. And you, I, I don't want to, you know, it's far too strong and pejorative. Like your book doesn't suggest that it's an indictment of crossoverness, no. but more a defense of genre boundaries. So yeah. it's a good thing that the boundaries are so rigid, but you know, what does it mean for fans? Well, not that boundaries are rigid, but I think those of us that love, as I do now, listening to all sorts of music, part of what we love is that there are such different genres to explore. Part of what is fun is that you can go from listening to a death metal record to a techno track to a pop song, right? Like that's exciting. And the reason you're able to do that is because these genres exist and feel a little bit different. So the idea isn't that no one should ever be able to cross from one genre to another. But the idea is that as listeners, we tend to love both of those things. We tend to love the freedom to be able to explore and hear all this different stuff and the sense of community that comes from the fact that sometimes it can be me and some like-minded people listening to some like-minded music. And again, you don't get that sense of community if there are no boundaries at all. If it's just everyone listening to everything, then you don't get that intensity that you see when you talk to a hip hop producer and they can tell you about the different drum sounds used on different records and like, oh, this record has this amazing kick drum sound, but it had been used in 1989 by this person. I mean, that kind of intensity creates the richness, for example, of the hip hop tradition. And so you don't get those records without the intensity of a bunch of people all thinking about and listening to some of the same stuff. And you also said in the book that these musical boundaries and musical genres are a little bit like politics in that they're defined not just by the things that we love, but by the things that we hate. Yes. So tell us about that. Because, you know, you can think about, like, there are people, remember that time where it seemed so popular to really hate disco? And yes. some people love to hate country music or yes. hate rap. Uh, what does this definition by hatred mean? Well, I mean, I think most of us remember, especially when you're young and you're using music to kind of form your identity that part of that identity formation is the sense of, I don't want to be like those people. I want to be like these people, right? And this is, this is fundamental to the idea of musical taste, right? It's one thing to like all kinds of music. But if you literally liked all music, that would mean you had no musical taste at all. It's really not possible, I'm not sure, to like or love some sort of music without disliking or hating some other kinds of music. Now, this can be related to politics, for sure. Disco is a great example, right? Disco is this moment where it feels like, oh, everyone's going to be listening to the same sort of stuff, right? Like there's a Star Wars disco record. There's a Rolling Stones disco record. Diana Ross is making disco records. The Bee Gees are making disco records. And it was this amazing coming together, right? There's a moment where I think nine or, or seven, eight or nine of the top 10 records on the pop chart are disco records. And it's like, oh, we finally have a universal music. This is so exciting in a way, right? And it's, it's inclusive, it's diverse, Latin music, gay culture, all this stuff is contributing to it. That's really exciting. But it's no surprise or should be no surprise that it provokes a backlash. It provokes a bunch of people saying, we don't want to do this. You have a, a riot in Chicago at a baseball game where people are asked to bring in disco records to burn them. And so there's this kind of rock and roll pushback where like disco is not real music. We have to get back to electric guitars and we're going to we're going to have a revival of rock music. You know, punk music kind of arises as a reaction against disco. But there were also underground DJs who also didn't like the idea that these records like Disco Duck and, and some of these Bee Gees records and this John Travolta movie, that this was how dance music was defined. So there was a reaction against the popularity of disco, even within the world of dance music. And that's how you get the, these black producers in especially Chicago and Detroit creating house music and techno music in the aftermath of disco. And I think anyone who's you know familiar with American culture, American politics, 
you know, this is a familiar story, right? If something gets popular and sort of seems to have some momentum and then generates a backlash or a series of backlashes in which people say absolutely not. And again, it's, it's kind of a pendulum swinging. I mean, I think it's possible we're at that moment now. We're at a moment where Spotify and on these streaming services, it often seems like everyone's listening to the same kind of music, right? It seems like, you know, what genre is Lil Nas X? Uh, you know, kind of all of them, right? And whether it's Billie Eilish or it's Justin Bieber or it's Post Malone, there's a lot of artists that are drawing from a lot of different things. And there's some R&B and there's some hip hop and there's some pop. Some of them are even kind of gesturing at country. And so we might be at another one of those moments now where it feels like everyone's coming together and listening to the same stuff. You know, you don't have to go to the record store anymore. You can just click over to the next stream and check everything out. And one way of thinking about that is like, well, maybe this 50-year history of genres expanding and fragmenting, maybe we're at an end and maybe something else is happening. But the other interpretation is that maybe the pendulum is going to swing back really hard, right? Maybe some new version of punk rock, some new version of I don't want to be like that, some new version of hip hop is arising even now and we're going to splinter again. It's interesting you talk about the backlash. I can't remember the name of the documentary, but I saw this documentary not long ago about disco. And they had footage of that incident that you described, like a bunch of people in a stadium burning records. And yes. I was like, this really seems extra. This is extra. Uh, so genres, gatekeepers, are the new gatekeepers, the algorithms by which Spotify and Apple Music and the others find new songs. I mean, you go on Pandora, you input, you're like, I like. Yeah, tell us, what do you type into Pandora? We need to know. Recently, I typed in Glass Animals. I've been listening to a lot of, is it alt? I don't know what you call it. I mean, you talk again about how these things are being redefined. So I put that in and then I get all other kinds of music that maybe I haven't heard of. Like I discover, you know, remember, I don't try to like, I'm not trying to like keep up with the millennials, y'all. I'm Gen X. There's only so many hours in the day. Right. There are only so many hours in the day. But, you know, I, I learned new music just because Pandora, Pandora one day fed me Sir Sly. Pandora taught me Pair of Stellar. You know, Pandora taught me music. And so it seems that are we, are these boundaries going to be reinforced because we're getting a lot of our musical decisions from programs that are giving us new choices based on our old choices, if that makes sense. That's really the question, right? Like radio stations in the old days were trying to draw audiences as big as, as possible, right? So they could sell ads. But what they discovered was the best way to draw big audiences was to be tribal and to say, we're your home for rock and roll. You know, this is hip hop and R&B all day long. And radio stations certainly work to build up these genre distinctions because they found that there were these communities that they could sell to advertisers. And the question is, what happens in a more algorithm driven musical marketplace that we live in now? And in theory, what the algorithm might be doing is it might be identifying new kinds of communities. It might be saying like, hey, Tanya, this, this stuff that you seem to like is actually similar in some ways to stuff that this random person in Minnesota likes and, and this other random person in Delaware likes. And so they like this other song, so I'm going to feed that to you and maybe you'll like it too. And if there are real communities out there, if there are groups of people that tend to like similar stuff, maybe the algorithms will identify those communities and those groups. And you know, I think this goes back to the fact that even now, even at a time when listening to music can just be like me and my laptop, we're really social creatures. We still have friends. We still talk to our friends about music. And often when we listen to music, we're thinking about other people. We're thinking about, well, what kind of person likes this music? Who would I see if I went to the concert? And so it seems to me that even in a streaming age and even in this really weird pandemic moment where our music listening is that much more solitary than it has been before, it seems like it is still a social experience and we might still find that these communities are emerging. Like we're humans, we love communities, we love to form communities. And I don't think that, that that's such a profound urge. I don't think that goes away just because we're hearing music in a different way. And I suspect the, the robots, the algorithms, will get pretty good at identifying these communities that we love to form, even if they take slightly different shapes than the old ones. You've got these 
different genres, rock, R&B, country, punk, hip-hop, dance, and pop. And in the book, you point out that there's a reason why you focus on those. Tell us why these? Why aren't we also talking about classical music? Why aren't we also talking about jazz? Um, why aren't we also talking about, you know, now a lot of popular music is Latin influenced. Where does all of that fit in in the context of your book? Any history, like any genre, has to include some stuff and exclude some other stuff. And certainly a word like genre, you could zoom in and see it in very micro terms, right? And you could talk about the difference between like melodic death metal and progressive death metal and technical death metal and blackened death metal. Like you can get super specific or you could zoom way out and say like popular music is a genre and classical music is a genre and, you know, maybe world music is a mega genre. So, you know, there's no reason not to do that. I wanted to tell a story about what, about the way popular music works. And so, yeah, I had to make a few decisions. One was I was focusing on, on genres that were kind of built around popular culture, built around pop charts, built around music videos, concerts, selling records in a marketplace. And it seemed to me like classical music was living in kind of a different place. Jazz and some of the rootsier genres were living in a different place and had their own kind of history. And then also for much of the last 50 years, not always, but for many of those moments, Anglophone music and Latin music had been a little bit separate. There have been times where they kind of cross over and times where they go side by side. But the world of Latin music is such a big and rich and fertile world. Obviously, you could write a whole book just as long as my book on the differences in the genres within Latin music. And I say in the book, I think one of the things that's happened with streaming, which is really cool to see, is Latin music and Anglo music combining in a different way, where 20 years ago in like the, the Ricky Martin era, there was this idea of like, well, if you want to quote unquote cross over and you're a Latin artist, like you've got to start singing in English, right? And now things have changed to the point where we're seeing the opposite, right? We're seeing like Justin Bieber singing in Spanish to cross over to that audience. And that's partly because if we're thinking about the musical audience, this book that I wrote is very much about America. But I think in the next 50 years, as the music marketplace goes more global, maybe some of those old assumptions are overturned. I mean, I believe there's more Spanish speakers in the world than English speakers, right? So if you're talking about crossover, the crossover would be a crossover to English language pop. And I mentioned in the book, depending on how you define hip hop, you know, you could Latin trap and, and reggaeton and all this stuff is really living side by side with hip hop. And a figure like Bad Bunny, who to me is as impressive and as important as any figure on the musical landscape, shows that what's expected of musicians has really changed. And there are opportunities for someone like Bad Bunny that didn't exist 20 years ago, didn't exist 30 years ago. So Kelifa, tell us, what will we learn from your book about the high points and low points in each of these different genres? What's a high moment in rock? What were the transcendent moments in rock and in the other genres that readers will appreciate and kind of digest when they get into your book? That's a great question. I think, I think one of the things they'll learn is that sometimes, especially at the time, it can become really hard to tell the difference between a high point and a low point. I think about the neo soul movement, right? Late 1990s, you know, people like Erica Badu and D'Angelo and Maxwell come out and they say, like, you know, R&B is really sick. Like, something's gone wrong with R&B, and we need to like bring back some of the authenticity and some of the soul to that music. And on the one hand, they produce some amazing records, right? I, I love those records. On the other hand. You go back and listen to the R&B of the mid to late 90s, the mainstream R&B, whether it's Jodeci or Aaliyah or whatever, those records are pretty great too. In fact, it can be puzzling if you go back and you're listening to like an Aaliyah record, which is all over the radio, you think, what were people talking about? And, and so sometimes what seems really obvious at the moment, you see this a lot with hip hop, right? In the late 90s, there's this idea that like hip hop is at a low point, right? It's, it's too much about money. It's too much about bragging. Whereas we go back now and we listen to like the Joe's Jay-Z records or those outcast records that were coming out then. And we're like, you know, not that it's any disrespect to Yasin Bey and Lauren Hill and these people that were doing something different, but like those mainstream hip hop records were really great too. And so 
part of what I love about music is the unpredictability of it. And the, the fact that what seems like a high point to one generation could seem like a low point to another generation and vice versa. I, I talk a lot, you know, about rock and roll and the different things that rock and roll has meant over the years, right? And the way you go from the, the hair metal 80s to the grunge 90s and how both of these things, the Motley Crue thing and the Nirvana thing, were in their own way trying to be true to the spirit of rock and roll. They just had different ideas about what that spirit might mean. One of the ironies is that rock and roll, you know, in the 60s is identified with the future and its youth culture, but in some ways it ended up being the most traditional of these major genres, even more than country music. When you think of a rock band now, it's a drummer, a bass guitar, an electric guitar, maybe two, and a singer, sometimes a keyboard player. Like, that lineup hasn't changed really since the 1960s, where in country music, there's always a, a new argument about, are we going to have fiddles? Are we going to have a string section? Are we going to have horns allowed on our country records? Is it important to have a pedal steel guitar? What are we doing now with electronic beats? And so in an odd way, rock and roll ends up being, in some ways, the genre that changes the least. If you tell someone right now that you're a rock and roll fan, they're probably going to assume that, among other stuff, you like the Rolling Stones. And like, that's exactly what they would have assumed 50 years ago. And like, that's probably true. You don't, you don't hear a lot of rock and roll fans that are like not interested in the Rolling Stones. Whereas if you tell someone that you're a country music fan today, that could mean a whole bunch of different stuff, right? That could mean Casey Musgraves. It could mean Johnny Cash. It could mean Morgan Wallen. It could mean all sorts of things. So I think some of these genres are more flexible than others. And in some ways, the most flexible of all is pop music, which I'm not even sure is a genre. Uh, you know, I included it in my book, but I write about that, that in some eras, pop music has been a sort of catch-all category. You're a pop artist if you don't belong to anyone. It's like you're homeless, like no community will claim you. So you're just pop. You're just out there floating on the pop charts. Sometimes you're pop if you've been kicked out of a genre, like you used to be like, uh, country singer, but then you quote unquote went pop, right? This was the Whitney Houston debate, right? And, you know, was Whitney Houston a quote unquote real R&B singer or was she just a just quote unquote a pop singer, right? They, they called her the prom queen of soul when she first came out, which was like kind of a compliment, but kind of not really. Kind of not. Yeah. Kind of not. It was kind of like, a little, you know, throwing a little bit of shade at her because wasn't, it's true, right? That pop was sometimes thought of as almost pejorative. Like you don't have a real sound. You're just generic and bubblegum. And there was a kind of a counter movement I write about in England in the 1980s, where people started to act like Boy George and some of the, you know, the new romantic or the new pop or the new wave, whatever you call it, the people with the funny hair. Um, started, to, started to really claim that pop identity and say like, no, we're pop musicians. We're not rock and roll. In fact, they would say, oh, rock and roll is boring. It's just these like old dudes with guitars. It's not interesting. And pop is colorful. It's fun. It's exciting. And when you hear the music through that lens, you can hear it a little bit differently, right? You hear the 80s, not as a Bruce Springsteen world, but as like a Cyndi Lauper world. And, you know, I think that that has also been really influential, whereas now, you know, there are acts, I, you know, I think of Katy Perry, I think of Doja Cat now. There's a lot of acts that are excited to claim the banner of like, we're making pop music. And so pop kind of starts off as this pejorative and kind of becomes a genre unto itself, even as people are still thinking about this. You know, Justin Bieber, when he's nominated for a Grammy in the pop category, he complained recently on Instagram, I think. And he said, I was really trying to make an R&B album and I kind of wish you would put me in the R&B category. That's where I feel like I belong to this album, not pop. You've been described as one of the essential voices in music and culture. That's what my mother said, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know, she called me right before the show. Um, <laughs> And so when you look, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, how these two, obviously music's a big part of culture and music influences culture. Uh, Luther Vandross complained about not having a number one album. Justin Bieber complains about not being labeled an R&B artist. Right. What do these labels or what do the genre labels say about us culturally? I mean, it strikes me as pretty significant that now, you know, there are black folks singing country music. That was something that, 50 years ago, I think was not, uh, not that it's a super regular thing now, but there's certainly 
more crossover and kind of more intersectionality. What does the music crossover say about what's happening in the rest of our culture? Well, I mean, I think part of the reason R&B and to some extent hip hop have long been defined as black music, right? In the, in the early 1980s, Billboard even takes its R&B chart and renames it black music, which rubbed some people the wrong way because they were like, well, we don't really want to be like segregated here in the black music category. But at the same time, some other people saw it as like a celebration of like, no, this is black music. It's an all inclusive term. It can mean all sorts of things. You know, the truth is that the reason why, you know, some of those categories, including racial categories, are important in music is that they're important in society. Right. And that that because our society is still somewhat segregated, our musical categories are somewhat segregated. And, and, and this is something even now. Right. And this is something that we'd want to think through. In other words, like I think it's pretty easy to celebrate and to understand the importance of black music categories. Right. That there are these artists that tend to be black artists that are making music that's disproportionately popular among black audiences. And we call that black music. And like, that's great. But. Black people are only 12% of the population in this country. And so if you have genres that are disproportionately black, that means you're also going to have genres that are disproportionately white or disproportionately not black. And that's a hard thing to think about. In other words, like you, it's easy to say like, yes, country music should be integrated and there should be more black people in country music. But do we also want there to be more non-black people in R&B? And beyond a certain point, will there be not enough black musicians to go around? <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Like, and, and this is the thing, right? Like the reason that R&B exists in, in the way that it does, even still today, and the reason that a, an artist like, I was listening to the Her album this morning, and the reason why an artist like Her can draw from this incredible history of R&B music has something to do with this history of musical segregation. And, you know, I think quite rightly, that's something that makes people uncomfortable to a certain extent because it can be hard to figure out how much we want to celebrate it. And, and what, I, what I would say in the book is that musical divisions, I don't know, it's hard to say, like, are these divisions good for society? Are they not? Or, you know, do we want to be more coming together as one? And, you know, those are hard debates. What I can say is that in music, those divisions help create this incredibly rich and diverse landscape. And you wouldn't get that in the same way if everyone was all together doing everything. And, and so historically, at least, it has been really important to have genres where Black people are not a minority, even though Black people are a minority in this country. And, you know, I think, you, I think the question going forward is, do we have lots of divisions in this country? Or are we moving toward a point where it's just like two teams, like it's a red team and a blue team, and there's going to be like, red team hit singles and blue team hit singles. <laughs> like, you know, you see a little bit of that, you right? Do. There's a country song this summer. Am I the only one? Aaron Lewis, a former lead singer of Stain, who's now a country singer. And it was kind of a conservative protest song. And so you're seeing some examples of some of the political divisions at play in the world of music. And I think that's one of the big questions for the next decade. And it's always been, I mean, music has always sort of reflected our political anger, aspirations, wishes. So yes. that's really no different. Who do you like? Who are your favorite artists right now? Who's great? Oh my goodness. I have favorites kind of all over the place. I love Jameson Rogers, a country singer that just put out a record that I really like. I like super obscure stuff sometimes. There's a sort of a death metal band from Finland called, called Aransi Pazuzu that I think is really excellent. Oh, Aransi Pazuzu. No. Yes. <laughs> hey, you never know. You never know. You know, also the Olivia Rodrigo record that came out earlier this year from the, you know, the Disney Channel actress from High School Musical, The Musical. And she's like a pop star who's drawing from bits of, of punk rock in a really interesting way. And that's one of the top selling records this year. I really love the Morgan Wallen album, this dangerous double album by this country singer who, you know, was now was probably maybe better known for getting booked on SNL and then kicked off SNL for violating COVID protocol. And then he plays SNL and the record comes out and he's caught on tape using the N word and then he's kicked off country radio and then he's brought back onto country radio. You know, that record is a good example of how some of these distinctions, you know, he is kind of a polarizing figure in the way that music can be polarizing, right? And, and one of the things that's interesting to me about music is not to make too many assumptions. There is this idea that music can change the world and has a certain amount of power. But if music can change the world for the better, 
it could probably also change the world for the worse, right? It's, it's hard, and often it's hard to know what the result of any record is going to be. If you look back, you know, writing this book, I was looking back to the last 50 years, and it's surprisingly hard to find a record or an album or an artist and to say like, oh, they made this change in the world in this specific way, right? Often it's a little more unpredictable. It's a little more diffuse. Rolling Stones release a song called Brown Sugar that seems to be about sex and slavery. Like, what does that mean? Like, I don't know. What's, what's the result of that song being in the world? I don't know. It probably inspires a whole bunch of different things that are hard to predict. So yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm still, I'm still deep into music, into new music especially. Um, I listen to mainly new music, <laughs> and, and like most grown-ups, I think. Yeah, I'm not. I don't. Every, I feel like every day I hear a, a new band or a new song or a, you know, a new rapper or something that, that makes me excited and often makes me confused. A lot of times my favorite music is the music that I hear, and I think, huh, what is that? And then I take a little while or I take 500 pages to try and figure out. Is there a song that you can think of where you're like, gosh, this sounds good, but it is just so abhorrent what you're saying. I can't listen to it. And you feel kind of guilty for liking it. I don't really believe in guilty pleasure. I'm, I'm probably a little bit unusual in that from when I first started listening to music, right? I'm, uh, I started listening to punk rock and I would hear people say like, oh, these punk rockers, they seem just like me. Like I could start a band too. That wasn't my experience with punk rock. My experience with punk rock is this stuff seems weird and maybe scary. I remember going to my second punk rock show ever, a, a Fugazi show in Boston on uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day. And there's this club and there's a bunch of skinheads in the club. And I was like, are, are they going to beat me up? Like, what's going to happen? This is, and, but that, that, that shock and even that, that, that fear was part of what seemed so exciting about the music. I've always, to me, my interest in music is a, is a curiosity that borders on nosiness, right? It might be related to being an immigrant and I'm like, I'm in this country and I'm trying to figure out like, what is going on? Like, what are they doing over there? What are they listening to over there? So to me, the idea that people making music, the songs would express a different point of view than mine that has never been surprising to me or never been an obstacle to me because I'm just curious. I want to, I want to hear it. I want to know what people are thinking, what they're, what they're talking about. And I've actually never assumed that my favorite musicians would have the same political point of view or same view on the world that I do. You know, half the time, I don't even know what I really think about anything. So yeah, to me, part of the fun is being able to enter those different worlds and maybe being able to encounter someone who thinks about things very differently from how I do. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the beautiful way that you started your book, which was with the story of your father. Oh, thank you. As he was dying and your mother wanted to give him a soundtrack. Yes. And so he wore the headphones that you'd just given him. Tell us a little bit about that before you go. My father came from Gambia in, in West Africa, and he grew up, you know, the traditional instruments there is the kora, which is this kind of 21 stringed instrument. And my father was part of a group of people. His, his family would be expected to be the patrons of the musicians. You, you pay the musicians money, they sing your praises, the griots, right, in, in this culture. And my father never lost his love for that music. And as a kid, as an annoying little punk rocker, um, I wasn't that interested in it. Although I did one, I did sort of learn to play the kora at one point. But Obviously, I came to love that music, but for my dad, that was kind of what felt like home. And that was the music that, you know, just reminded him of his world and also reminded him of the world that he left, right? I think, I think part of what, what he was hearing when he heard that music wasn't just this kind of traditional connection to it, but the fact that he left. He left the Gambia. He ended up in America thousands of miles and worlds away from where he grew up. And so the idea that music can on the one hand kind of bring you back home, but at the same time, sometimes it can be a way of measuring how far you are from the home that you had. And the idea that music could be part of your search for home or a search for a place that feels like home is something that was really, really interesting to me. And, you know, in a complicated way, I'm not going to claim that my father had any interest at all in punk rock, but Maybe something that uh, that I inherited from him. And, and if you were here to read this book, I hope he would see some of himself in it. You mentioned that your father was the driving force behind your family moving to America. Yeah. And seriously, you are living the dream. <laughs> you are living the dream. I mean, 
You're a staff writer at The New Yorker where you get to write about not just music, but culture and other interesting things. Uh, you were a music critic at The New York Times. Uh, you get to go to concerts. I mean, I remember <laughs> not I was so bad. reading in the book. Yeah, you're like, I can basically go to any concert I want to at any time and get paid for it. Like, you are living the dream. But I got to tell you, my friends got a little, for the first like couple months, my friends were like, great, this is great, let's do it. And then like, you know, a few months in, it's like some Thursday night. And I'm like, yeah, I got to drive out to Long Island for this thing. Do you want to come? And they're kind of like, yeah, I don't know. It, it, became, it became harder sometimes to, uh, to, to convince them to come along. But yes, it's like that kind of a job. The music critic job is the ultimate job where you can't complain about it because no one wants to hear it. Nobody wants to hear it, man. <laughs> like nobody wants to hear it. So before you leave, what is your advice to young people. We're really right now in such a weird time, right? I mean, like a lot of these kids are coming out of COVID. They're just getting back to school. I think things that were hopes and dreams or maybe now everything's fuzzy. You have a job that people would kill for. You are a writer. You get to write about great things. What do you say to young people who want to follow in your footsteps, even if not specifically, they want to go have a really cool life doing cool things. And right now it just seems like Work is always hard. What do you say to those people? Well, I mean, the most basic advice, you know, and it's, it's, it's helped me, it's probably helped you too, is, you know, figure out what you love and figure out what you're really good at. Like, figure out what it is that you're good at, that you're better at than other people. For me, it was a love of music and then a sense that I had ideas about music. You know, I played a little music, but I was always terrible at playing music. I never brought anything to it. But I felt like, oh, maybe if I could, if I could get the opportunity, maybe I have something to say about it. And, and one of the upsides is it's gotten so easy, so much easier to do homework. And even in, in this era where everything is so accessible, I'm always surprised that you can really get a, a sort of a leg up on other people by reading books. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're interested in a topic and you go read five, six books about it, you know, compared to people, compared to people you might encounter on social media, like all of a sudden you're an expert. And the idea that you can really, and it doesn't even have to be books, right? It could be documentaries. It could be going out and interviewing people, but that kind of work, that kind of research is always helpful in any field. It, it's helpful to me. What I realized was it's helpful to know something really deep. I got a sort of, I got like steeped in punk rock. I got obsessed with hip hop and in a weird way, that was helpful to me even when I was writing about something else. To know a lot about something, I found, has been really helpful even if you're writing about something else. And, you know, one of the things I learned very quickly when I was a music critic at the New York Times was that on any given subject, any artist I was writing about, any singer, any album, I was not going to be the ultimate expert. There was going to be someone out there who had like, you know, who woke up in the morning thinking about bluegrass and went to sleep in the evening thinking about bluegrass and had done that for 50 years and had a wellspring of knowledge that I was never, ever going to be able to touch. But on the other hand, that if I did some research and asked some good questions and talked to people, you know, I could feel like I had something to say about this subject. And so that combination of knowing that there's always someone who knows more than you about whatever it is that you're interested in, but also that, you know, you can learn about it if you put in the time. That has been a really helpful pair of lessons for me. Califasane, one of the things he just said, everybody, was to read books. I'm going to say that you should read his book, Major Labels. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> I'll say it. I'll say it. Major Labels, A History of Popular Music in Seven Genres. Califasane, thank you so much for being here. This was a great conversation. I, I, really, I really enjoyed it, and I hope you'll come back. Thank you so much. It's the dream when you write a book like this to be able to have a conversation like this about it. So thank you. Thank you. We'll speak soon. The Tanya Acker Show is written and executive produced by me. Sam Fragoso is my producer. Cole Mitchell is my composer. Sydney Freeman is my production assistant. And my show dog is Maximus Justice, also known as Max. If you like us, please go on to iTunes and leave a five-star review. Maybe I'll even have the chance to read it on the air. I will give you my hugest and most profuse thanks if you do. Thanks for listening, everybody.